Well, hello. I'm Richard O'Brien and you're watching Noise11.com. Lucky you. Are we welcome into Noise11.com, Richard O'Brien. Uh, welcome back to Australia. Is Thank it you. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, Rocky Horror Show is your life or is part of your life? Oh, part of my life. Yeah, a part of my life, a big part of my life, I suppose. Um, but not, you know. Um, yes. The answer is yes, Paul. Mm. <laughs> because I think I saw, saw the first credit, uh, you know, in your illustrious career goes way back to the mid '60s in a Carry On movie. I started. I, I got to England uh, back. To, I, I went to England for years working holiday in 1964. Uh, by ni- t- 1965, came around the spring of '65. I, I found myself in London. Uh, I met up with some people that I'd been on the boat with, so coming out, going back to England. And um, and we another guy and I auditioned for we saw in, in the stage newspaper that we were looking for people to ride horses in movies, and so we both went along on one wet Thursday afternoon to a paddock out in Rice Slip somewhere, and uh, and and they brought out a big fat mare, and uh, with no saddle and just a bridle, and we all had to get on it. There, there, there would be um, auditionees. Um, I had to get on this horse with the chap I was with had been boasting I was an Australian actually mm. um, and he was boasting which is unusual for Australians um, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me uh, <laughs> and he'd been saying about you know how he'd been in the, the outback and he could ride like a, you know he, he, he did all that you know um, and then he couldn't stay on the horse uh, which was interesting and, and I could I, I was able to dig my knees, and I, I've, I've been brought up in New Zealand, and, I, and the horse is there. The, the saddle wasn't there. You, you, you rode it anyway, and you just got your legs, so you got your knees in tight, and um, you know, and made sure you could stick like glue. Um, so I got the, the gig and uh, went out to Pinewood Studios and rode a horse around a paddock there. And now I was riding horses in movies. I did three movies in '65 mm. on uh, horses. But then they introduced the stunt register uh, about that time. They, they, up until that point, there was no there was not, no such thing as a stunt register, and you had the, and, to, and to get on the stunt register, you had to have three applications. It didn't matter what they were. It could be motorcycle riding, motocross. It could be swimming, diving, anything, uh, fencing, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to become a stunt man per se. I, I wanted to I wanted to be an actor. And so I took myself away from that and took myself off to a drama school. And in those days, of course, the method was, was what mm. we were all after. We wanted to all be mean, moody and magnificent and, you know, internalizing, you know, like Brando and, you know, and, uh, all those guys. Um, so that's what we were doing, studying Stanislavski and all that kind of stuff being mean, moody and magnificent. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then it was like everybody else, you know, you come away from that and try just, you're, you're a dropping, uh, jobbing actor, out of work more times than in work. And, um, it, but you don't want to do anything else. Uh, in the, and while I was out of work, I, I used to ensure that I stayed around the theater. So I, I got jobs in the theater, either with you know, the electrics or hauling up um, props or, or, or sets, you know, anything, uh, just to be in, in commercial theatre. Got a pound a show, used to live on nothing. Um, you know, but I, I, I was happy I, as long as I was near and around the theatre and watching the shows each evening, watching the actors uh, from the wings, seeing how they did and how they did it. Uh, seeing those that you know shouldn't be doing what they were doing, all that you, you learn quite a bit from watching good actors and watching bad actors so too. You can learn mm. from that as well. So that was all good stuff. Yeah, it's uh, you know quite a, a, a I guess uh, a natural progression going from uh, you know knowing to be a cowboy to being a cowboy in a movie, going uh, to be a leper. 
uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, I'm uh, sure you didn't have training in that before you did that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, threw me hand in. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have to say, though, you know, when you're bringing back the, the cowboy and the carry on cowboy, because they did, you know, give you the guns and, and, the, and the horse. And, you know, they say, yeah, well, you know, we're not, we won't be turning over until another hour. And you've got a horse and you're dressed up like a cowboy. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Go out there and play cowboys. <laughs> it doesn't matter how old you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you recall for us uh, how Rocky Horror first popped in your head? Um, I wrote, I was, I was out of work, I'd been, I'd been let go from Jesus Christ Superstar and I was out of work and somebody said to me, um, it's the staff uh, Christmas party at EMI Studios, do you want to come out and, um, you know, do a, I don't know, do an entertainment? I said, well, what are you talking about? I said, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. I said, okay. And my eldest boy had just been born, he was uh, Linus, he was, he was a babe in arms and I thought, I was thinking of coming back to New Zealand, giving up the the, the business, and because I'd let, been let go from uh, from Superstar, not because I didn't feel uh, I didn't have any talent, but because I felt I had an hour responsibility, and I didn't have any right to keep keep doing what I wanted to do, just you know, be that selfish, because I had a child now to provide for, and I thought I'm going to take use this as a test. If I can go out and do 15 or 20 minutes and, and make them laugh, amuse them, if I can win the 20 minutes, then I'll, I'll, I'll stay and give, give it a go. If I can't, then I'll, I'll use that, you know, if, if I get such a bad response. So I wrote some jokes um, and I wrote a song called Science Fiction Double Feature because it was EMI Studios. And I, and I said, these are the kind of songs that, these are the kind of movies that I like. And, and, uh, and I sang that song. And a friend of mine was there, a chap called John Sinclair, who's now a rabbi living in Israel. Um, and uh, I said to him, why don't we write a musical, a, I don't know, horror musical, sci- sci-fi, horror, B-movie musical. And he went, OK, cool. And uh, then he went off and opened a recording studio. And uh, I was left while he was doing that. And then I met Jim Sharman and Richard Hartley and, and, and others. And we... And, uh, I started to develop it on my own, and by the time uh, John opened his studio, he said, "Well, so why don't we start working on the on the on the musical?" And I said, "Well, actually, it's finished now, and it's going on next week at the Royal Court Theatre. Um, but we'll I tell you what we'll do: we'll we'll record a cast album, regardless mm. regardless of whether it's a success or not. You know, because that generally a cast album was only made if the if the show was successful." Mm. I said, but even if, if the show is not successful, we'll still make a cast album. We'll make it at your studios. So that, that's exactly what we did. Although we we'd had the su- success from day one with the show, it was um, the word of mouth on that was fantastic. We we didn't have to sit, we didn't have to publicise the show. It was mm. it was extraordinary mm. how that got around. Mm. Steve Reeves, who you name check in the uh, in the show, mm-hmm. uh, who passed away in two thousand. But did he ever see the show? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know that uh, um, uh, Fay Ray sent a, sent a, t- uh, a postcard to, um, to, to Tim Curry mm-hmm. when he was playing Frank in, in Los Angeles. She was, must have been very old then. Uh, and I know uh, recently uh, I received a letter from, a, from a, a, a woman who's written a book on vaudeville and um, Lily Sincere was was terribly pleased to to to, to get a mention, mm. you know, and and I was also uh, I was also at the BBC about three or four years ago, and um, um, there was the children of Jeanette Scott and um, and that singer with they used to call a voice like Velvet Fog, and I've forgotten what his name is. Do forgive me, um, but his children were there. Jeanette Scott's children were there, and I was. Talking to them, and I and, and they went. Oh, Richard O'Brien. Oh, my mum's mum's here. You got you gotta go. You gotta come and meet mum. You gotta come and meet mum. And I went over, and uh, and there was Jeanette Scott and talking to to uh, another friend of mine. And I said, "Well, hello." And she she looked across. And I said, I, um, "I've just been talking to your lovely children. I'm Richard O'Brien." She went, "Oh my <laughs> God! Thank you so much for that." 
you know, just the mention of that opening song, that's my pleasure. <laughs> but it's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> it is nice. Yeah. There's been some amazing people that have been in the Rocky Horror Show over the years. In fact, I was only talking to Russell Morris the other day, mm -hmm. who played Riff Raff in one of the early Australian productions. Good heavens. And uh, Glenn Shorrock was the narrator in that uh, actual yeah. Australian show, you know, back in the, I think it was the late 70s, he was saying. Yes. But there was also, um, I think it was a New Zealand production that featured Gary Glitter at one point. Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was nothing to do with me. It was uh, it, it, my, my, my agent at the time that were like, licensing the show out and they they licensed it out to um, our original Rocky uh, Rainer Burton uh, was directing for some reason or other and uh, and Gary Glitter played played the role of, uh, of, of Frank and Furcher in, in New Zealand um, a strange man he is. Mm. I, I only met him a while. No, I met him twice. I, 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 was, I was being interviewed on, on, on British television once, and um, Emma Freud was, was, was production uh, manager of, the, of the, the show. And she said, oh, Richard's going to be in, interviewed by Gary Glitter. I went, really? <laughs> oh, okay. And I sat down. And he asked me questions and answered them. And I, I, he, so he asked me the question. I go, and... And then he'd answer the question for me, and I, oh, oh, you know. And then he'd ask me another question, and I, all I did was go and oh, but, <laughs> and and I came off, and Emma came up and said, "So what was it like being interviewed by Gary Glitter?" And you go, "Well, I mean, was I? I don't, I, I didn't realise that I was." And the next time I met him was at, um, he'd done, he'd obviously played Frank, and I was in a, a going into a, an Indian restaurant in a Fulham Road, and and he was there, with young people around him and, and and I was going in with James Dearden who wrote wrote Fatal Attraction we were going to have an Indian nice Indian and and Gary Glitter went Richard <laughs> like that you see and dragged me across this counter that he's mm. gone and I oh okay yeah hi oh ooh, mm. and I got in the restaurant and James said uh, so uh, do you know Gary Glitter I said no I never met him before <laughs> my entire life uh, but I'm so glad that uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Actually, yeah, well, I don't want it to be associated with that. Sorry, I put it back into your, yeah, in, no. into your well, memory. Well, you know, I, 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 there are two rules. There are two rules written in stone: absolutes. Yeah, they, they're imperatives when it comes to sexual relationships. No coercion, no exploitation. Mm. You cross that line, then you whatever happens to you, you deserve a mm. bullet in the head or whatever. You know. There was no coercion and no exploitation, and what he was doing, and what you know, these people that um, interfere with children, the bullet. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Penn and Teller also played narrator. Yes. On, on, in Broadway. So how, yeah. how did that work? Because uh, I don't know. I wasn't there. But I suppose they had a trick up their sleeves. <laughs> uh, but I thought, well, one of them doesn't talk. Uh, I'm not sure which one, Penn or Teller. But. I have no idea. They, they, yeah, so, well, Dick Cavett had been, been playing it before them, and Dick Cavett is, is a lovely man. Um, but he used to come on as a narrator and go, hi, and uh, how are you tonight? And ten minutes later, he'd still be there doing, doing being Dick Cavett mm. with, the, with the audience. And I was in there one night, and he got to about 10 or 15 minutes of few jokes about the, the Bush administration and, you know, how they, you know, diddled the votes in Florida and all that kind of stuff, you know, going on. And he said, and I hear, yeah, I see the narrators, uh, I see the authors in tonight. If he's very lucky, he may, he may even hear some of his own dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Meatloaf in the movie. Now, this was uh, this movie was made pre Bat Out of Hell, yeah. so like this was before Meatloaf uh, went on to become famous a, as a singer. Yeah. He was he must have been quite an unknown at that point when you had him in the movie. Yes, he was. He was a he was a young guy from Texas. Uh, was uh, trying to establish himself as a singer, and he certainly had the voice to do so. Um, Joe Papp wanted him to sing opera uh, in the park in New York. Um, so he was, obviously people had heard him, and I have to say that, you know, when he used to sing, For the Thrills, as Dr. Eddie, uh, Dr. Scott, uh, used to be like a, like a shard of a broken glass coming through the, through the air and pinning you to the seat. It was so wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, well, we were lucky to get him, and uh, it, it was difficult. He was difficult. He was a, it was a, a very um, conservative Texan, 
and uh, wasn't quite sure about you know the 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 content of the show whether it was going to um, you know offend him and his um, his upbringing. Um, he didn't want to be in the fishnets. He was very you know very loath to get into the fishnets. But of course, once he went out in the wheelchair, you know, the first night, and the leg came out for the thrills, <laughs> and the leg came out with a fishnet on it, and the, the audience roared with laughter. Mm. Well, no stopping him. Once he get when, once Meatloaf gets a laugh, there's no stopping him. <laughs> he, he 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 he'll be there all night. You know, mm. it's like you know you have to be very careful doing um, charity shows. I don't know if you've ever done a charity show, but you know you have to be very careful you don't get top the bill mm-hmm. because if you top the bill. You know, odds are you'll be you'll be performing to the cleaners because <laughs> everybody's supposed to do five minutes, ten minutes. You know, but if you get a comedian on the mm. stage, you know, so get you, them off. You, you, they're not going to they're not going to leave until they've got a laugh. Yeah, and once they've got a laugh, you know, then they're now not they're, gonna yeah, leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're still not going to leave. So yeah, their, t- their ten minute ten minutes becomes twenty, and the next person, you know, by the time. So you be very careful with comedians. Yeah. Yeah, and they're not happy people generally. Mm. And you know, I've, I've, I know that that's a cliche, but it's no, it's, it's, it's a kind of true. truth, no, isn't it? It's true, yeah. yeah. Miserable bastards, most of them. <laughs> how'd you how'd you get uh, Susan Sarandon on the, the movie? Which I think that was her very first movie. Ah, uh, no, it? her first movie was Joe, which I'd actually seen. Um, um, Peter Boyle and, uh, and and her, she played the daughter. Right, so it was uh, one it, of the it, first ones. Then. Uh, it it was her second movie. I would I would suggest a second movie, um, and I didn't have anything to do with the casting of that. Um, uh, Barry, of course, was uh, just played Danny Zuko on, on Broadway, so he came from a, a, a musical uh, background, um, singing and dancing, uh, and they were they were they were lovers at the time when they auditioned for Jim Sharman. Uh, and they came across as a couple. They weren't any longer a couple by the time the, the movie was over. Um, they'd sort of gone their separate ways. Um, but th- that was interesting as well, uh, because uh, I think that even that dynamic had, uh, had, uh, had an effect on, on the performances, um, because um, Janet becomes s- slightly stronger. There's a, there's, a, 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 there's a feminist kind of streak in Rocky, isn't there? He he comes at the beginning, you know, patronizing her. It's all right, Janet, everything's going to be all right. You know, he's the guy, you know. And, oh, I'm so scared, you know, and she's here, silly little thing, you know, yeah. patronizing. And then as, 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 the, as the movie goes on, he loses that. Yeah. And she c- comes up, you know, uh, uh, it's beyond me, help me, mommy, he's going mm. at the end. And she's, I feel really bad times. She's, you know, she, she's gone the other way. Um, and I think that that was um, reflected in their relationship as well. Uh, so, yeah. Did you envisage that that's how the characters would go when you... Oh, we were determined to break them up. Mm. No, of course not. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 no, it's just, uh, it's just uh, the nature of the beast. I'm, um, I don't know. I don't know whether... I don't know maybe things we, we're introduced to things in our life and we we don't realize that it's going to be a tool to a change in our lives uh, or cathartic for instance we did a, a friend of mine Bill Wyman's a chum and he had some uh, some film footage not much of, of them as, as as kind of 18 year olds 20 year olds of the Rolling Stones you know and he wondered whether it could be used in some kind of to some effect there wasn't enough of it, and um, the, the chap that he'd asked to direct uh, direct it said to me, "Can I write some stuff for him?" And I got to know Bill, and we made this kind of movie the best we could out of what we had, and and um, and I'm talking to Bill recently, you know, and now what we did was film a marriage breakup. Mm. We didn't know that's what was going to happen, but that's basically at the end of the day that's what we were doing, mm. um, and maybe the making of the movie. Uh, brought it to a head, you know what I mean, the situation to a head and, and, and rationalised it and the outcome was the end of the marriage, I don't know. We never know, do we? Cause and effect. Mm. As you were creating Rocky Horror, uh, in, in, in your mind were Brad and Janet to be the stars or did you envisage that uh, the Frankenfurter character would become as uh, big as what it became? I don't know really. I mean, it's... it's um, 
it's a retelling of the fall. Brad and Janet are Adam and Eve, and the serpent is, Bra- is, is Frank and Furter. Um, Hansen and Gretel, Babes in the Wood, is again another retelling of the fall. Um, Bra- um, Hansen and Gretel are Adam and Eve, and the wicked witch in the house is, is the serpent. Um, so it's a rite of passage story. Uh, I don't know that I had any any. All I was doing was writing an entertainment to please myself that made that I would like to go and see. I was writing a show that I would like to go and see, yeah. and I had no idea that there were many other people like myself that would 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 find it enjoyable. But you know, I was obviously wrong. What about the song uh, "Sweet Transvestite"? When did you come up with that one in the um, overall creation of the show? Uh, probably in my bedroom at the time, looking at myself in the mirror. <laughs> I've got no idea. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> um, I, have, I have no idea. I, 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 it just seemed... It is very, it, it, I have played the role very, uh, occasionally, but it's very empowering. And I think that that was another wonderfully refreshing thing when Tim came down you know, with a cloak on and then went, I'm just... Uh, unashamedly mm. and stood there with his hands on his hips unashamedly and you're like you know and you've got a problem well fuck off mm-hmm. you know it was it was liberating and empowering not only for him but for anybody else because we all all of us have a uh, um, a narcissistic exhibitionist streak in ourselves all, all of us thankfully most of us you know, you know, rein it in. Otherwise, the streets would be impossible, wouldn't they? <laughs> if, if there was, if it just yeah, very entertaining. Yeah, well, well, maybe, but scary too. I think scary is a, is a word. Um, I mean, I did see in, in in London once after one of the shows. Uh, uh, Rocky was, I'd been in the downstairs bar, and there was, and I turned around, and there was a guy trying to go up the stairs, and he was wearing heels that really not made for for the street or what no, no there was it was made for sexual purposes these heels are far too big to walk on and he was wearing a leather kind of jock strap with a thong up his ass and uh, and trying to get up the stairs and all i could see was this you know this back view which was wasn't at all pleasant and as it was going up the stairs i thought I think I might be in some way responsible for that. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> mm. I bet. Yeah, well. Yeah. You know. The song The Time Warp took on a life of itself, didn't it? It became a hit song on well, its Well, in own. Australia, yeah. Um, and, and that was Molly that was uh, that made it a hit here. Because it's the most unlikely single, isn't it? Mm. You know, but uh, because you've got three different voices singing and it's uh, it's it's not really a... I, I, it is astonishing. I never, I never, and it was a, it was, it was a, it was a comedy, comic song. I wrote it as a comic song, as a, as a, as a comedy against all those other songs that have been dance songs like The Twist or The, the Hucklebuck or mm-hmm. The Locomotion, you know. I wrote it as a, as a kind of, as a, as a spoof song. Um, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. What about uh, the sequel then that came along? Well, it's not really a sequel, is it? Shock Treatment. Shock now, you treatment. didn't write Shock Treatment, but you appeared in it. Uh, Shock Treatment was supposed to be Monsters Rising from the Grave. It, was, it wasn't supposed to be called Shock Treatment. It wasn't supposed to be anything to do with um, um, the way it turned up. That was six or five, six, seven drafts later it turned out to be what we had. And I still think we were probably too early with it. I think we could have, should have spent another year before we, the cameras turned over. It's a deeply troubled movie, um, narratively. Um, the, the, the soundtrack has great promise. There's some nice songs in it. Um, but it's a, it, 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 it was, it was ill-born and not fully formed. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know what else to say about it. Um, other than it's got some merit, um, it's, it's certainly uh, un- unknowingly, unwittingly um, predict the um, the wannabe generation and the, and 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 um, reality television kind of nonsense that's going on. Um, these people that want to be famous just to, for being famous, uh, all that kind of insanity. Yeah, it does feature Brad and, Sh- and Janet. Yes, it does. 
um, going through a marriage kind of break up again. Uh, yeah. And it's, 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 it's interesting to look back at it now and see, see some of the players, Rick Mayle and, and, and uh, Barry Humphreys and other people. And, and, and it's, it's, so it's, it's, got, it's got a lot of merit. My, my, my daughter loves, loves the movie and there's a lot of people that actually really adore this movie. I can't, on the other hand, because I'm, I, I know that I, I didn't do my best work with, with the narrative. I, it, it's, uh, it's annoying. Mm, you played opposite Patricia Quinn. Once again, yes. Yeah, and uh, did you know her nephew? Is it her nephew who's the drummer in Snow Patrol? Uh, I believe I believe she does have uh, yes part part of her family in, in Snow Patrol. Yes, that's true. Mm. Mm. What about uh, the most recent thing that I can see that you've done was a, a puppet show in two thousand one called Mongrels. I was a yes, I think I was in in, in, a, in a in a in a television puppet show called Mongrel Mongrel Mob or something like you know something mm. like that. Yeah, mm. sang a song I think as a dog, <laughs> as I, I recall. But you you just get up and go to the studio and do these things. I mean you don't think about it. And then you go home and have breakfast. Uh, <laughs> I can just imagine the phone call. Uh, Richard O'Brien would like you to uh, yeah, sing on. a song as a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll be there. Yeah. 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 I, 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 there was a th- Jack Boots over Whitehall. It was made out of action men figures. And, uh, I don't know who went to see this. I got no idea. And uh, Elaine Page has a radio program. She said, "So why did you do that, Richard? Why did you play a German?" I said, "Well, <laughs> I didn't realise anybody was going to have a problem with it." You know, I said, and I just wanted to say, you know, for you, Tommy, so why is it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, congratulations on the season here being extended, which is uh, you know, fantastic yeah, it's news. It's another week, yeah. 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 What, uh, what will happen for Richard O'Brien after this couple of weeks in Melbourne? Uh, we're going to go, go back to, to NZ and we have, um, we have a, about a month there. And then we go back to the UK for some more work there in September. And then I, I, I've got to, um, I've, I'm writing a, I'm, I'm, me and Richard Hartley are having a go at another, another kind of musical idea. And I have to do, I have to do some serious work there. Uh, on, once again, on the, 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 the storyline, the plot at the moment is exceptionally linear. And it, it, it needs, it needs some counterpoint to it somehow or other. It needs, it needs something that's uh, just a, Give it a um, pull it away from this this direct line somehow or other. It's um, it's once again it's nuts and bolts. Mm-hmm. You know it's cre- it's that's the craft side of it. I have to I have to clean that up. But we're we're getting there. Some good songs and good ideas. Uh, is there a title for that yet? It's called Alive on Arrival. Mm-hmm. It's about a girl that goes to the land of the dead and she's still alive, and uh, they're scared of her. Why wouldn't they be? Mm. <laughs> Well, the Richard O'Brien story to be continued then. Well, Can't wait some, to hear some, something like that. Yeah, keep yeah. working. Keep, keep, keep. I've been writing some songs actually just for the sake of writing them um, about noir uh, movie kinds of themes, you know, detective, hard-boiled detective dialogue kind of songs, uh, which have been fun. I've written three of those and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try some more of that because it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting... A kind of area, isn't it? It's, it hasn't been too much of that. Mm. Will you um, release them? I've got no idea. You see, I'm just very lazy and I have no ambition. Um, so they're written, and I have friends that um, that have a studio just around the corner from me in New Zealand, and and I have every opportunity to go and and, and pop them down. And I keep saying, I'll come in one day, you know, and, and do those. And I never bother because I think once I've written it, I've kind of done it. Really, I don't, I, you know. I only paint and draw and write for myself mostly. Um, I'm, it's, it's, I don't, you know, don't prance around for applause too much, you know. Mm. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing what comes of all of this. Richard O'Brien, been a pleasure to uh, talk to you and hear the. Uh, it's it's hear the my story. pleasure. I wish you would stop. I wish you'd stopped uh, emailing your chums while I was talking to you. But you know, <laughs> these days, young people, young people yeah, today. I was updating my uh, Facebook <laughs> status the whole yeah, way yeah, through. Yeah, of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> Richard O'Brien here at Noise11.com.